Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love Online. You know, one of the hardest things for us to really understand is that love factor. How do we love? What is love? Where is the love? <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. So let's go to Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 43. Here we go. Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemy. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. You know, it's hard for us to sometimes realize how when we think we're kind, loving, caring, and, 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 and we polish up our halos and, and wash up our wings so they sparkle in the sunlight, we don't realize that sometimes, no matter how how many good deeds we do, that our heart may actually be void of the love God is talking about. And the one thing that we also forget, another major detail, is that love is the ultimate foundational thing that we live on, we walk on, we 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 work out of the motivations behind whatever we say, do, think, feel, respond should be out of love. So out of love, there should be a lot of things that we don't allow ourselves to do because out of love, we always have to be mindful of how we affect other people, how we influence another person's opinion. We influence another person's behavior, attitude, reactions, whatever. We influence that. And out of love, we have to be mindful of how we influence another. Okay. So a lot of times I look at a lot of born again Christians. Let's look at us. Let's start at the house of God as God's word says judgment <laughs> must begin first at the, at the house of God. So let's look at us and y'all. <laughs> the body of Christ. We say we love. We say we care. We operate out of the foundation of love because God is love. God is our Father which art in heaven. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is God. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead bodily. So we are full of God. Right? Wrapped up, shaped up, tied up, all tangled up in God. But my question to many of my brothers and sisters in Christ is where is the love? What happened to that? What happened to the love factor? We got the sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, we can get that down pat. We got the giving and the sharing and the giving of a ride or passing on some clothes or feeding the homeless. You know, we can do that pretty good. But here's the thing I want to ask you. Where is the love when you see 
somebody that you don't think that much of. And they come around. They come in your room. They come in around your house, your surroundings, your job, whatever. Your church. <laughs> and when they walk in, your heart walks out. They walk in the room and you tie up like a knot. And you know, some of those knots that sailors can tie, it, don't, it seems almost impossible for them to come loose. And some of those knots in your heart that tie up when that one person walks in the room, all of a sudden, where is the love? It's non-existent in your heart. Why? Have you asked God what's really going on in that heart? Does the lack of love, wait, let me ask it a different way. Is the lack of love a result of unforgiveness? Is the lack of love a result of resentment? Is the lack of love a result of you being intolerant and judgmental? Is the lack of love a result of your contempt? for someone else. See, if you can laugh at somebody, if you can make that person a butt end of your jokes, if you can tease and qua qua and, and tee hee and all of that on that person's character, making fun of them, laughing at them like they're nothing, like they're totally invaluable, like they don't even count in your scheme of things. Yet you lose you lose mine or you lose the the idea, you lose the I can't think of the term I'm looking for, but you lose um you lose touch. You're out of touch with the fact that that very person you're making jokes out of. That very person you're making fun of. That very person you put down and 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 use as your butt end of jokes, you think they are a joke in your mind, in your scheme of things. They are a joke. They are just a a, a messenger of Satan. They're not even worthy of your conversation or your prayers, because to you they're nothing but a joke because you have contempt for them. Have you lost sight, there's the word, have you lost sight of the fact that God loves them just as much as he loves you? God values them as much as he values you. And while you're looking at that person, or let's say looking down at that person, have you thought of that scripture that says all our righteousness is as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf, which puts you in the same category as the one you're making fun of, the one you're joking about, the one you have contempt for. Now, see, some of you in your families, you have a brother, a sister, a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife, a relative, a neighbor, whatever, where when they come around, all of a sudden, you pull out your drawer of snide remarks and your tongue gets to slashing to the left, to the right. Your tongue becomes a machete. Mm. Yeah. And your words become the bullets of a gatling gun. Why? You enjoy watching them flinch as you insult their intelligence. You enjoy watching them squirm as you make them look bad in public with your demeaning, snide remarks. <laughs> you enjoy it. Why do you enjoy that? And here's the question, you loving saint, child of God. Where is the love? Because love would not allow you 
to say those things, make those remarks, give those looks. Love would not allow you to signify on them. Love would not allow you to make that person end, ending up as a butt end of your jokes. Love would not allow you to humiliate them, disrespect them in public. Love would not allow you to raise your voice at them in public and show your annoyance, your aggravation, even if they have rightfully or wrongfully or however, even if you, let's put it like this, even if you have a right to be annoyed by them, maybe they did something that always annoys you. Maybe they did something that is thoughtless and they always walk around as calamity jane or 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 clumsy flumsy they're just always breaking something in your house or knocking something over or they're like a bull in the china closet and you know when they come around you got to put away all your valuables or they will devalue by breaking something because they always do well it doesn't mean that you are to disrespect that person. It doesn't mean that you are to make fun of them and put them down, humiliate them, demean them in public. You don't have the right to do that. There may be a reason why they are the way they are. There may be a reason why they break stuff, why they're clumsy, why they're they are a uh, calamity Jane, so to speak. Everywhere they go, something gets broken. Something gets messed up. Something gets screwed up. A whole situation gets misconglomerated because they're in the mix. There's a reason for that. And a lot of times what people don't realize is because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, we take out our aggravation that should be aimed at our enemy, which is a spiritual enemy, which is a demonic stronghold, a demonic attack, a demonic interference. We take it out on the person who is being used by the enemy to get under your skin. And you lose sight of love. You lose sight of the warfare you're in. So you're playing right into the hands of the enemy. You're playing into the dirty hands of the enemy by taking your frustrations out on your fellow brother or sister. Have you thought of that? <laughs> so when you get aggravated and your words become the bullets of a Gatling gun, and you're speaking holes into their soul by all your insults and your snide remarks, by your anger, by your wrath. And God does say forsake wrath in Psalms 37. When you attack a person like that, you are playing into the dirty hands of the enemy. Think about that. Think about how that's why love is so important. Because love will stop you from hurting someone. Love will stop you from shooting holes in their soul. Love will stop you from using your tongue as a machete, cutting a person into little pieces and fragmenting them even more. They are already damaged, that's obvious. And you are inflicting more pain. But the sad part is when you enjoy doing so. You know you don't have the love of God working in your heart when you do that. So even though you may rebuke and cast out devils, even though you may speak with tongues of men and of angels, even though you may have the power to raise the dead, <laughs> do all kind of wonderful works, if you're not operating in love, baby, when that time comes and you walk up and stand in front of Jesus, 
And he looks at you and says, I never knew you. Depart from me, workers of iniquity. That iniquity is the lack of love, baby. That iniquity is working side by side, hand in hand, with the very enemy of Jesus himself. Anytime you allow yourself to attack your brother or sister, you should never have to raise your voice at anybody to get a point across. Now, I know this is a world where it's your fine. You do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you who to sock it to or who not to sock it to. But you sock it, you kick it, you speak it, you do it. You do what you're big and bad enough to do anyway because you're grown. Well, sweet pea, you were bought with a price. You are not your own. And as long as you consider yourself part of the body of Christ, you have to use self-control. Where do you get self-control? You can't buy it at a store. You have to ask God to continually Fill you with his Holy Spirit, because with his Spirit comes the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, mercy, self-control. Named in the Bible is the word tolerance. That means you're not peeing all over yourself every time you feel the urge. You hold it till you get to the bathroom. Well, that's the way you are supposed to control your emotions. You hold that tongue. You hold those emotions till you get to God and say, okay, God, help me get this crap out of me. And let God do the flushing. Let God do the cleaning. Let God do the washing. So you don't have to get out there and do damage with your flesh. Now, let's go to. Second, uh, excuse me, First Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to paint a picture of what love looks like, what love acts like, how love waddles and quacks. Starting at verse 1. And this is for those of you who are highly gifted in the spirit realm. You move in the spirit. You operate in the spirit. You see in the spirit. You hear in the spirit. All oh, your powerful workers and of wonders in the spirit. Starting at verse one. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Let's stop right there for a second. When was the last time you made a snide remark, a sarcastic remark to your husband or your wife? When was the last time you made a little dig in the flaw of their character, something you see as a flaw or a weakness, and you threw a little dagger in that flaw because you're sick and tired of dealing with it? When was the last time you did that? Huh? Was it this morning? Was it five minutes ago or five minutes before you you tuned into God's church of love? When was the last time you insulted your child? You said that little cute remark that you say when they do that annoying thing they always do that just gets all up under your skin. When was the last time you did that? Oh, well, did you do so-and-so? <laughs> yeah, I knew it had to be you. What? <laughs> What's that all about? Where's the love in that? <laughs> I know you had to be doing the driving for that to happen. Really? Where's the love in that remark? Mm, mm, mm. Well, if you quit looking at all those women, maybe you can get something done. You won't be having car accidents. Huh? See, little remarks like that, we think are harmless because we didn't cuss. We didn't hit anybody. We didn't set the house on fire. We didn't do any voodoo dolls sticking pins we didn't do any witchcraft casting spells and curses. We didn't do any of that. 
but you are annoyed. And you're going to make sure they know it. They feel it. So when they do do something good, you're going to make it a point not to pat them on the back. Because they don't deserve it in your book. No. No, 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 no. They don't get your compliments. It's not going to happen, baby. See, it's not only in what you do and say. It's also in what you do. Don't do what you don't say. You notice how there are times when people get around and they compliment that very person that stays under your skin, that very person that rubs you raw. And you make a point of walking out the room while they're giving them compliments. Mm -hmm. It actually annoys you. To hear them get any accolades. Because if you could say what you knew. You tear all that down. And enjoy doing it. So you walk out the room because you can't stand hearing that person get any credit. Why is that? Think about how you are feeling when that particular, you know who that person is. When they get around you, when they are in the room with you and other people, how you felt before they walked in and how you feel now that they're right there in your midst. Oh, why do they have to be here? Oh, man, I thought I was going to enjoy this crap. Why, who invited them? Really? Where is the love, y'all? Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, hush, and not charity. I don't have any charity. I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Liking that sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal, put in your mind a string of cans tied to the back of a car. Those cans are always empty. You know, that's what they do at weddings. And as the as the bride and groom drive off, the cans are click, 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 making a lot of noise. What this is meaning is if you are void of God's love, you're just making a bunch of noise, baby. That's all you are is a bunch of noise. Tooting your own horn. Bragging about what a wonderful Christian you are. Telling all the wonderful things you did for the Lord. Verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy, oh, in the two months, the Lord's going to bless you with money. So though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, oh, I have a word of knowledge for you, my brother or sister, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, charity, love. Charity, love. I'm saying it over and over so you get the point. That's what charity means. Love, agape love. Unconditional love. It ain't the love that says, you rub, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. You shake my hand, I shake your hand. You do me a little something, something, I'll do you a little something, something. No. And have not charity, I am nothing. Nothing worthless. Three, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, <clears throat> and though I give my body to be burned, <clears throat> and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. It's all a work of va vanity. It's, it's worthless. Four, charity. Here we go. Here we go. This shows what it's really about. Charity suffers long and is kind, not mean, not nasty, not, not sarcastic, not irritable, not grumpy, not grouchy. <clears throat> Charity envieth not. So it's not going to sit up there and say, oh, I know you thought you were all that in a bag of chips just because they gave you that little trophy don't mean you were that you're worth a hill of beans in my book. 
Uh, hello, jealousy is very ugly, y'all, and God don't like ugly. Now, let's move right along, verse 4. As we already said, charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envieth not, it's not jealous. Charity vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. So you don't have to walk around tooting your own horn. You don't have to walk around telling everybody all the wonderful deeds you did for this one, that one, and the other one. Five, it does not behave itself unseemly. Mm -hmm. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Why do you get so angry so fast? Why is your temper so short? Thinketh no evil. Why are you so suspicious? Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hope all things, endureth all things. You know, <laughs> I got to go back to something I was saying a minute ago about the things you don't do. And the things you don't say can be just as harmful as the things you do and say. I got to go back to that. I'm feeling that. One of the reasons I said that, some of you parents don't give your children any affection. You don't give them any accolades. You don't sit down and spend time with them. You constantly remind them how wonderful your life would have been had they not been born. See, the Bible says, he that, and this is what I want you to be aware of, when you don't do some things that you ought to be doing. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him that is sin. So when you know to do good, any parent knows they're to nurture and boost up and encourage and uplift, teach and counsel their kids, give them the affection they need, the approval they need to receive. But if you're not doing that, baby, to you, that is sin. Don't walk around church talking about how wonderful God is, how much you love God and your neighbor, and you give your, your neighbor a ride. You will go out of your way to help your pastor. You will go out of your way to help deacon so-and-so and elder, El, El, elder Applebush, but you won't take a minute for your child. Something's wrong with that. You won't do anything special for your wife. Why won't you do anything special for your wife? Because behind closed doors, you're too busy slapping her upside the head, punching her in the gut, and belittling her in public and around your kids. But in public, everybody's wonderful. Everything is beautiful in its own way. But you get behind closed doors. What you say to me, you better get in there and get that food ready before I knock you on your behind and hear the cuss words fly and the fists fly and the feet fly and the plates fly and the forks fly. And the kids are trying to fly for safety because they don't know if you're going to turn around and knock them out, out, out conscious as well. No, you're so busy wreaking havoc in your home. You're the tyrant. When you bark, everybody bows and you love having that kind of power and control. But when you get to church, oh, aren't you the sweetest? Aren't you the most charming, the kindest, the sweetest? You're hell at home and it ain't no baby. That ain't love. That's hypocrisy. Your phony is a $3 bill. All right, let me soften up here because I, I can get a little rough around the edges. So let me soften my touch. Let's continue reading. Five, I'm repeating this because I want you to get what it really said. Doth not behave itself unseemly, which I just described. Seeketh not her own, is not controlling is not easily provoked, just as angry as can be, hot-tempered, short-tempered, just blow off at the drop of a hat, thinketh no evil, is not, let me put that into everyday language as well, not suspicious, 
What you know? Why are you talking to to, uh, to him so long? I don't know why you have to talk to him. I'm your husband. Hello. They're having a conversation. Duh. But no, you got to see something ugly in it. See, when it says think it's no evil, here's another description of thinking evil. <clears throat> I'm going to try to, to cut this thing short because this thing can go on ad infinitum. When you think evil, it's another way of saying you're suspicious. So my question to you is, why are you suspicious? See, the Bible also says about suspicious people, mm -hmm. it says, to the defiled, all things are defiled. So if your own spirit is defiled, if your own motives are ugly, nasty, underhanded, deceptive, guess what? When you look at someone else who has a pure heart, who is a clean-spirited person, who is loving and kind, you're going to see evil in them. Everything they do that's good, you're going to see that something's wrong with what they did, something why they did it, there's something behind what they said and all of that. Because you know that you are foul, baby. And if you're foul, everybody else must be as well. So you walk around uh, uh, punishing everyone else for the foul, nastiness, the ugliness, the dirt that's in you. And everybody else has to pay the price, even though that's not what their case is. But because you are defiled, everything around you must be defiled as well. Can't nobody be any better than you, so they must be jacked up just like you are. And you punish them for that. Hmm. Yeah, think about that. Think about that one. Thinketh no evil. Six, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. So two ways. You can, you can switch that, bo that blade both ways. It cuts both ways. Rejoice is not in iniquity is another way of saying you're not reveling in someone else's sin. Oh, you did that? Oh, that's cold-blooded. Oh, I bet they were hurting. <laughs> and you're rejoicing in it because you think they got them told. You think that they did them dirt and you're glad about that. Or they got them back and you're glad about that. Okay. Or the other one is rejoice is not in iniquity is you're not celebrating the fact that you did some dirt. <laughs> I got I got away with that one. Oh yeah. That was sweet. That was, oh, oh, if I could just do that again. I love that. That was that was a Kodak moment. Did you see their face? All right, here we go. But rejoices in truth, bears all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity faileth. Charity, excuse me, never faileth. Love never fails in everyday language. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. You know, we prophesy in part, y'all, so that we're always going to fall short in that area. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect, that's love, is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. You, you know, we, <laughs> okay, let's read the next one and now I think I'm done. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. You know, this past two cents again, shamefully, a lot of us are still a child in grown-up bodies. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So that means you don't have any temper tantrums anymore, right? Your children don't have to fly across the room and be banged up against the wall. They don't have to go to school with black eyes. Your wife doesn't have to walk around with sunglasses on to hide all the bruises you've inflicted on her body. Hello? Put away childish things! For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, 
But the greatest of these is love. I'm using love in place of charity because I want you to get that point. Where is the love, y'all? What is love? This right here will tell you what love is and what love is not. Are you willing to learn? Are you willing to change how you express your air quote love to other people? Or are you still going to do it your way? It's your thing. You're going to do what you want to do? Or are you going to do what God wants you to do and love the way God wants you to love? What are you going to do with this information you just got? All right, I'm going to leave you with that. God bless you. Now, if some of you want to know what to do, pray to God and ask him to show you what real love looks like. Pray to God and ask him to show you real love and character by how Jesus did what he did, said what he did, said what he said, refrained from the things he could have done. Ask God to show you by looking at the best example you could look at. Our God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. God bless you. I want to introduce you to my new book that I wrote after I got my doctorate in eschatological studies. A dramatic paraphrased commentary on the book of Revelation and end times prophecy. Check it out. <laughs>